With Nottingham Forest winning the playoffs, we now know the 20 teams that will make up the Premier League next season. The odds for winning the league, finishing in the top four and for relegation are now available on Betfair. I'm going to have a look at these markets and give my first reaction to see if I can find any opportunities out there for myself. This is absolutely not betting advice, nor is it my final predictions for the Premier League next season. As what the teams do in the transfer window will affect my thinking and I'll do more analysis as the season get closer and closer. This is just my initial thoughts about what I think about these markets. Predicting how the Premier League will finish is genuinely impossible. And I'm fully aware that making a video with some predictions about what I think might happen is the fastest way to publicly embarrass myself at the end of next season. Having said that, I did predict last season's league table more accurately than the supposedly wise crowd, made up of many tens of thousands of people who predicted the league table on the BBC's website. On average, I predicted teams finishing 2.6 places different to where they actually ended up finishing, compared to the crowd whose average prediction was that teams would finish 2.9 places away from where they actually finished. I don't tell you this to show off, in fact I tell you this to do the opposite. I'm showing you this to show how bad both me and the crowd are at predicting something like the league table. It is just too complex to predict accurately. Like the crowd, I had some shocking predictions. Man United finishing above Liverpool, Everton finishing in the top half are two prime examples of this. Predictions which seem indefensible now that the season's over, but must have felt somewhat justifiable before the start of last season. And I suppose that is the point that I'm going to try to make in this video. People tend to make league predictions which are drastically biased to how the previous season finished. This type of thinking is commonly known as recency bias. Here's an example of recency bias. Two seasons ago, Liverpool had a pretty poor season mainly caused due to injuries to key players. I'm sure many of you will remember that. Before the start of last season, me and the crowd both predicted Liverpool to have a poor season, finishing fourth. All because that somewhat poor season was fresh in everybody's memory and people disregarded the overall quality of Liverpool's squad based entirely on that one poor season which was caused pretty much purely by injuries. I believe recency bias leaches into the market and the odds often suggest that things will stay pretty much the same as they did the previous season. So given that, do I think there are any mispricings after my initial look at the market? Let's take a look at the top four to begin with. Based off what I was just saying about people predicting how the league table were finished, primarily based off the previous season, it comes as absolutely no surprise to me at all that the four favourites to finish in the top four are the four teams which finished in the top four last season. They're also in the same favourite order as the way the top four finished last season. So essentially, the market is forecasting the top four to be essentially the same as it was last season. Same four teams in the same order. So is that justifiable? Well, let me ask you this question. How many times in Premier League history has the top four finished in exactly the same order as the previous season? And if you don't know the answer, take a guess at it. Trust me, it will help refining your opinions about the markets. The answer is zero. Not once in Premier League history has the top four finished the exact same order as it did in the previous season. But of course, I can hear the comments already. I know that the top four market isn't actually about predicting an exact order the four teams will finish. But with the way that the odds currently are on Betfair, the market is essentially forecasting a repeat order of the top four, which is something that has never happened before. So obviously it isn't about an exact order, so let's ask another question. How many times in Premier League history has the same four teams finishing the top four irrespective of league position, so in no particular order, just the same four teams. The answer to that is five. Five times out of a possible 29 occasions where the same four teams make up the top four as the previous season in any particular order. This itself is somewhat skewed by the fact that the top four repeated itself three times in a row for a total of four consecutive seasons between the 05-06 and 08-09 seasons. But in general, we are still looking at a pretty rare occurrence around 20% of the time where the same four teams make up the top four as the previous season. So I'm looking at the market here on Betfair and thinking, should these four teams be the four favourites to finish in the top four? Or which of these four aren't great back value at all and potentially lay value? And also, which of these teams lower down the market have a good chance of potentially sneaking in there and their odds are good for either a trading or a betting opportunity? Personally, I think Liverpool and City should be 
absolutely fine. Unless there's some form of catastrophic injury crisis or something else very unusual happens, I don't see either Man City or Liverpool not finishing in the top four. So that brings my attention now onto Tottenham and Chelsea. Two clubs that I think might struggle finishing in the top four. Obviously they might get in the top four, but this is about looking at the odds and see, is it a valued price? To be honest, I think both of these teams could struggle without some serious squad strengthening in the summer transfer market. Antonio Conte was obviously a great acquisition for Spurs. He's a great manager and a proven winner. However, things can turn sour quickly at the club with that he is managing. And if things don't go well at the start of the season, or if he doesn't get the players in that he wants, the season could turn really badly, really quickly for Tottenham. And then looking at Chelsea, Chelsea have just lost the best centre-back to Real Madrid. It looks like Christiansen is leaving too. Aspil Quetta might also be leaving. Thiago Silva is getting another year holder. To be honest, it looks like he could start the season with such a poor set of centre-backs. And we all know how important it is to have a good defence to get anywhere in the Premier League. And from being tipped, to win the Premier League last season, it looks like Chelsea are looking a bit fragile to me. Similar to Antonio Conte, Tuchel himself has been known to fall out with club owners and we've got no idea what relationship there's going to be between Tuchel and the new Chelsea owner, so that's something to keep an eye on. And speaking of the new Chelsea owner, we also don't know how committed he is in investing in the club, how much are they going to spend in the summer? These are all questions which are up in the air. And in general, this uncertainty that I think is surrounding both clubs is a brilliant opportunity for me looking for any reason to lay either of these clubs. I'm not 100% committed if I'm going to lay either of the clubs at the minute, but this is my initial reaction after seeing those relatively short odds compared to the rest of the teams. Obviously, both teams could have great transfer markets. I could be proven to be an idiot here and both teams finishing in top four. That's obviously possible and you can laugh at me when I get it wrong this time next season. But I can absolutely guarantee that I will definitely not be backing them at these odds I'll be laying them or just not touching them. Looking further down the market here, who else realistically has a chance? Obviously you've got Man United and Arsenal, two big names there, two obvious other selections that might finish in the top four. I really like what United have done so far in getting rid of all the washed up players out of the club, freeing up the wage bill for the rebuild under the new manager, Eric Ten Hag. But to be honest, they are going to have to sign quite a lot of players and are all those players going to gel in time? to mount a top four challenge next season? Maybe. To be honest, I don't watch Dutch football, so I've got no idea how good a manager Ten Hag is or how well he's going to do at United. But I do know that United aren't as bad as people have been making out these past few months. Yes, they've been in truly terrible form, but remember, recency bias. And there is definitely a chance that they could challenge for the top four. At those odds, I'm not tempted enough to back, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did make the top four come the end of the season. Looking at Arsenal, I've been really impressed with the job Arteta has done there. There's been good steady progression over the few seasons that he has been there. And I really hope that he hasn't hit his ceiling with Arsenal. Time will tell, of course. They threw away a great opportunity to finish in the top four last season, which is now being blamed on injuries. But okay, I've got bad news for Arsenal, those injury concerns and those squad depth issues are going to become even more relevant next season when they have to deal with Europa League football, playing every Thursday night. And at them odds, it's too much of a risk, they're too short in my opinion, to, to justify backing them. I think they're going to struggle managing those different competitions and they are not a team that I'm looking to finish in the top four next season. Looking now at some of the bigger odds outsiders, I'm going to pick two to focus on here. And the first one is... Newcastle. Although in my opinion, realistically speaking, they're probably a bit too short to be treated as back value. A lot of people think Newcastle's rise to the top is going to be quite slow. But I actually think it differently. I think they're going to rise to the top a lot quicker than people expect. And that is based on the way that Man City did it when they had the big money takeover. With time, memory tends to fade. And that happened with me and how I remembered Man City after their takeover. I seem to remember it taking quite a number of seasons for them to, to start competing at the top level. However, when I look back on it, the truth tells a different story. Man City finished ninth in the 07-08 season before being taken over in September 2008. In that first season, they had a 10th place finish, but then improved drastically up to fifth place and third place 
and then winning the league the season after. City were genuinely challenging for the top four in their second season under the new ownership. And turning to Newcastle now, this is Newcastle's second season under the new ownership, although the first one was half a season, so it's only the first full season in charge. I'm sure, as you know, Newcastle had an impressive second half to the season last year, and it is possible that Newcastle could finish in the top four. In all likelihood, it probably is a step too far, just a bit too quickly, and the odds don't really justify me wanting to place a back bet, but I will be keeping my eyes on their odds as the season get closer and even in play. And the other outsider I want to look at is a bigger outsider, and it's actually Leicester. The market seems to be giving Leicester very little chance of finishing in the top four. And I think that's that's a bit harsh really. Leicester have had two fifth place finishes in the last three seasons, so they definitely have quality in their squad. I think people are writing them off too much based off how poorly they, they started last season, but in the end they did manage to salvage an eighth place finish, and plus that was with balancing Europa Conference League campaign, that ran pretty far, they got to the semi-finals in that competition, and with next season no European football, the squad's going to be focused on one goal and that's going to be to try and get into that top four. I definitely think they have got an outside chance of, of making it, considering those odds. I would be treating this as a trading position rather than a betting position. Hope the, the odds shorten as the season progress if they're doing well. There's risk involved in that, if they don't do well it's going to drift and go against me and it'll be a losing position. But I think with Fafana and James Justin back from injury next season, they, they've got a good chance. They've not quite fully managed to figure out a way to transition away from Jamie Vardy, but you know, next season, maybe it'll all click for them. So that's my opinion on the top four at the minute. I'm not committing to any open positions until the season gets a bit closer and I do more analysis on it, as a lot of things can happen between now and then, such as transfer activity. Before I discuss my feelings about the all-important title race, I do want to quickly discuss the relegation battle and the relegation market. It was probably somewhat predictable that the three teams that were promoted from the championship last season make up the three favourites to be relegated back down to the championship next season. Like how I did with the top four, it's time to ask another general knowledge question, this time about the history of Premier League relegation. Since the Premier League changed from 22 teams to 20 teams in 1995, there have been 26 occasions where the three promoted teams could all have been relegated the following season. So out of those 26 seasons, how many times have all three of the promoted teams been relegated? How many times have two of them been relegated? How many times have one? And how many times have somehow miraculously none of them been relegated the following season? The answers are three out of those 26 occasions, the three promoted teams all managed to miraculously survive relegation the following season. Just once have all three of the promoted teams been relegated in 1998, leaving 12 seasons where one team was relegated and 10 seasons where two of the promoted teams were relegated. So this gives an average of 1.3 promoted teams being relegated each season. So given that, it would be quite surprising if all three promoted teams were relegated next season. But once again, that is what the, the Betfair market is currently forecasting to happen. I actually think the three promoted teams are relatively strong this season, especially compared to previous seasons. Last season, for example, pretty much everyone already knew it was a given that Norwich and Watford were going to be relegated before a ball was even kicked. This season, not so much. It's difficult to see who's going to finish rock bottom next season in the Premier League. There does seem to be a common theme in the Premier League where at least one of the promoted teams tends to significantly overachieve. It happened with Brentford last season, of course, but it's also happened with Leeds, Sheffield United, Wolves and Huddersfield, all in the previous few seasons. It doesn't mean it's, it's guaranteed to happen, of course, but when I'm looking at these three teams, I'm thinking, if any of them are going to do it, who's it going to be? And based off a few online polls and the, the people I've been speaking to about it, I think most people are in agreement that they think the most likely team this is gonna be it will be Nottingham Forest. Whether the odds of Nottingham Forest are low enough to lay them, expecting them to have a good chance of overachieving, it's tough to say at this time, but I'm definitely not going to back them to be relegated at those odds. That's guaranteed. Fulham are an interesting one. To me, they still seem to be one of those teams which have got players which are far too good for the championship, but just are not on the level in the Premier League. I would not be surprised if Fulham were relegated again next season. I think of the three promoted teams, they offer the best value odds 
um, to back to be relegated. As I'm unsure on them. They might do well, but I could easily see a situation where manager Marco Silva is sacked, you know, in like October or something, and they just have a, a rubbish season again and are, are back in the championship. Whether they've learned their lessons about the previous few seasons, they've been in the Premier League, I'm not so sure. I guess we'll find out next season. Looking at some of the, the outsiders for relegation briefly, I actually think Brentford look pretty ominous to me. They got, they got decent odds. Towards the end of the last season, it did look like teams were beginning to figure out how to play against them and they weren't as effective. It looks like Ericsson is going to leave too. You know, I like Thomas Frank as a manager and I, I hope they stay up next season, but you know, they're one that I'm going to be keeping my eye on. The infamous second season syndrome could strike them down really. Another team which I've got my eye on is Crystal Palace actually. Uh, I actually predicted them to go down last season. I got that horrendously wrong. And I might do it again this season, because why not? I think Vieira outperformed everybody's expectations. But again, there could be a second season syndrome with him. The teams could start to figure out how to play against them. And one or two key injuries to a few key players, I think they could be in trouble. So that's what I'm thinking there. Again, I'm not putting any bets in until we get close to the season, but that's just my initial reaction to these odds. Maybe it's just because I would find it funny to watch a big club like Everton to get relegated, but I do think they're not completely out of the woods yet, despite surviving last season. This all depends on how much money they're able to spend in the summer. The squad needs strengthening, but if they're still hindered by how much they can spend because of financial fair play, you now it could be a very difficult season for Everton. I think they're extremely fortunate that Norwich, Watford and Burnley were all terrible last season or else they could have been in really big trouble. So I'll be keeping a very close eye on what their business is in the transfer market, whether they'll have to sell players to buy new players in, you know, it's going to be interesting. Which leads us to talk about the most important market and that is the, the title race. Who's going to win the Premier League next season? The market looks pretty set in its ways to think that there's only two teams who realistically have a chance of winning the league, which is obviously Man City or Liverpool. And to be honest, as much as I've tried to point out how much recency bias affects things, it's hard to really disagree with the market here. I can't see any of these teams further down the list um, really having a chance at competing for the league next season. The Liverpool Man City dominance is going to come to an end at some point. I just don't see it happening next season. So I'm going to be looking at these two teams competing again to win the league next season. So, my first opinion on this market looking at the odds, who's the best value for winning the league? And no, so I say best value for winning the league rather than saying who will actually win the league. Those are two very different questions. I might think Liverpool are the best value to win the league, but I might actually think Man City are more likely to win the league. It's all about value. So my thinking at the moment is City are really short odds, aren't they? That is really short to win the Premier League. So far out in advance before a ball has been kicked. But you know, you could potentially argue that it is justifiable after all, they have won four of the previous five Premier Leagues. It looks like they're going to start the season at shorter odds than they were last season. And one of the big reasons for that, and the thing that I'm going to focus on in this video, is the signing of Erling Haaland. Haaland is a fantastic striker, of course. Nobody could argue with that. And on some level, he's the perfect striker for Man City. If there's one way City could improve from an attacking point of view, it would be in converting their chances from the penalty box and the six yard area. Man City's forwards and the team in general score far less than their XG predicts for shots inside the penalty box and the six yard area. Haaland is clinical in these areas. Practically all his goals come from inside the penalty box. And unlike City as a team, Haaland considerably outscores his XG from both inside the box and inside the six yard box. So he really could be Pep's missing piece for this Man City team. Having said that, I do think the public perception on Haaland and City is that Haaland is going to perform a lot better than I think he actually will, especially in this first season. This is a prediction which could be horrifically wrong, could score 30 goals or something. But I do just tend to think that players from the Bundesliga don't always perform to the same level when they come to the Premier League. And players under Pep Guardiola can often struggle in that first season as they're getting used to the tactics. And Haaland himself 
isn't that great defensively or with his back to goal, with his hold up play. Those are two very important things for a Man City forward in the Pep Guardiola team. So, you know, things might not go according to plan with this Haaland transfer. Maybe it's clutching at straws. As a trader, all I am looking for is uncertainty in the market. Any uncertainty and any reason to lay Man City at these short odds. If I was to lay Man City, all I would need is them to drift at any point during the season. If they get a defeat towards the beginning of the season, their odds could drift out drastically, allowing me to profit. I won't be placing any bets until the fixtures get announced at the earliest, and I'd probably want to see some transfer activity too. But from my initial reaction, I think I'm going to likely lay Man City and hope that Liverpool can apply some pressure to them. And yes, I know that Liverpool have their problems too. And honestly, I can't argue with Man City being actually favourites. However, I just think the price is a little bit too short, in my opinion, anyway. I know I keep mentioning this, but I can't stress enough about the importance of waiting until at least the fixtures get announced and get close to the season before placing positions, not just for the title race, but for the relegation and the top four markets too. Teams with comparatively difficult starts, um, they could be good lay opportunities, expecting them to struggle in those games. That comes with risk, because if if they win and do well in those difficult games, then you know the price is gonna come shorter. Those considerations are what I'm gonna analyze in significant detail as we get closer to the season. Right now, this has just been my initial reactions about the odds. I'm anticipating a somewhat strange season. I think the break in December November, December for the World Cup is going to have some unusual effects, not just from a rest and an injury perspective, but also from a form perspective. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. It's going to be a lot of uncertainty and that's, that's good news for, for me and you as a better and a trader. This uncertainty is how we can get profits from the market. I'm interested in what your thoughts are for next season, what you're going to be betting and what you're going to be trading on. Let me know what you plan to do down below. And I want to take this moment to thank my Patreons who are supporting the channel and helping to make content like this possible. It really means a lot to me and it really helps me out. If you'd like to know more details about how you can support the channel and some extra perks that you might get, I'll leave a link in the description below. That's all for now guys, I'll see you in the next one.